Game begin. I'm a man, but I can change if I have to, I guess. Being right isn't nearly as important as learning the truth, and I'm not so arrogant that I can't admit when I'm wrong, or when I might be wrong. I should tell you up front that this video really isn't going to settle anything. I'm only going to spark more questions. But I've been skeptical of Lehigh Extreme Defense and Extreme Penetrator lines, as well as other fluted bullet designs for years. You know the saying that anything that seems too good to be true probably is. Today, we're going to talk about a test I did that started to change my mind a little bit on Lehigh bullets, maybe. But we really need to start at the beginning for all of this to make any sense at all. Before Lehigh introduced their extreme penetrator line, they produced their controlled fracturing and maximum expansion lines of pistol ammo. Both do what they're advertised to do, but that also means they fail to meet established performance metrics for defensive handgun ammunition. Now, I don't want to get way off of the weeds about it, so if your urge to know more is intensifying, the best place to start is to read the FBI report Handgun Wounding Factors and Effectiveness. But for the time being, it's enough to know that experts advise that fragmentation isn't useful in pistol ammo. So the controlled fracturing line, like the G2 RIP, accomplishes something that we really aren't looking for in defensive pistol ammo in the first place. And the maximum expansion line generally fails to meet minimum penetration requirements precisely because it expands so bigly, just as advertised. A few other companies have made solid copper hollow point ammo that expands too much to penetrate sufficiently as well. But Lehigh had already positioned themselves as a company that makes ammunition that fails to meet established standards in pursuit of questionable performance attributes before they came up with their fluted bullet lines. So when they introduced their extreme penetrator line about six years ago, I was understandably skeptical. Lots of gun tubers tested it and gushed about it, but they were mostly focused on the disruption left behind in the gel by the temporary stretch cavity. When bullets pass through tissue or gel, they push material aside, perpendicular to the direction of travel. This is called the temporary stretch cavity. At rifle speeds, this TSC is much larger and can exceed the elastic limit of the tissue by a significant margin, inducing tears that occur well away from the track of the bullet. But at typical pistol speeds, most tissue stretches less than its elastic limit, so it just snaps back into place with little or no tearing anywhere the projectile didn't physically touch the tissue. However, ballistic gelatin is less elastic than real tissue, so it tears pretty readily. Some people misinterpret the tearing seen as gelatin as indicative of wounding, but ballistic gelatin isn't meant to produce a simulation of the appearance of a wound. Its purpose is to produce empirical measurements that are useful for comparing cartridges objectively. The penetration, expansion, neck, and retained weight measurements produced by properly prepared and calibrated organic 10% ordnance gelatin do correlate closely with human and porcine soft tissue, but it isn't a wound simulator. So naturally, I took these results with more than just a grain or two of salt. Then I tested a few examples of the EP line myself and had mixed results. The 9mm did indeed penetrate deeper than FMJ of the same weight, but the 10mm version penetrated way less than 220 grain hard cast. So if you want a pistol bullet that penetrates tissue deeply, sectional density does the job much better than magical flutes. And if you're thinking Lehigh could just make an EP styled bullet that's heavy for caliber like 147 grain and 9 millimeter or 220 grain in the 10 millimeter I mentioned, it doesn't work that way. These Lehigh bullets are copper, which means they're less dense, and that means they are longer than a lead bullet of the same weight. So you just can't make a copper bullet as heavy because it takes up too much case volume. Bottom line is that heavy FMJ or hard cast will penetrate more deeply in a given caliber than Lehigh Extreme Penetrator. I still wanted to find out whether the flutes played any role in tissue damage though. I thought maybe the disruption in TSC we were seeing was just because they were light and fast for caliber. So I flipped the bullet around in the case and fired the same bullets backward. If I was right about the velocity being the cause, then the flat base of the bullet would be at least as effective, if not more, at the same speed. But I was definitely wrong. There was clearly more disruption in the gel from the forward-facing bullet. 
The next step in our thrilling saga, and the subject of today's video, is to see if that disruption seen in gel really translates to meat, or is it just something that only happens in certain semi-fluids? So let's get out to the range and shoot 9mm 124 grain HST and 90 grain Extreme Defender both provided by the generous support of Ventura Munitions through a hunk of pork shoulder, then marvel over this stunning high-speed video courtesy of Aimed Research. Okie dokie. So, let's see here. I placed these shots, hopefully, perpendicular to each other. All right, guys. So, the HST went through here, and it's a couple fingers wide. The Extreme Defense went through here, and you can definitely get more fingers through there. It, that's certainly a bigger hole, and the, the high speed reflects that too. In both cases, the entry is a little bit bigger, and the exit, that's something that's widely known. We see that in gel also. We see the lots of disruption up front and then it kind of tapers off. The problem with meat is that it's somewhat subjective. I, I'm not telling you inches and grains and <laughs> empirical data. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of big and there's a few fingers here, you know, that's about as scientific as the doctor probing around in Lincoln's brain looking for the bullet. So it's not like this is remotely conclusive, but that's fairly convincing. So now we have in clear gel, in real gelatin, in dead meat, and anecdotal reports from, from hunters. I'm starting to come around on this stuff. So what did we learn? Well, that's the problem with shooting chunks of dead meat. It looks really cool, but it doesn't tell us much. First, Dead meat isn't living tissue, it's a lot less elastic. So it's important not to view this demonstration as any sort of scientific test or objective measurement. It's also important to note that there are uncountable variables in play that could cause significant differences. Meat isn't homogenous, so the paths that any two bullets take could intersect with varying structures within the meat, like ligament and tendon. Same goes for the expanding temporary cavity. It might be restricted by a tendon in one case and split right between muscle groups in another shot. That said, the high speed clearly shows a bigger temporary stretch cavity from the Lehigh bullet and after all that fingering, it did seem, subjectively, that the hole in the meat from the Lehigh was also larger. So does that mean that it's a good choice for defense? Maybe? I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but as cool as this looks, it still doesn't really prove anything. It's promising, and I want to believe. But the only thing that we can say with any degree of confidence is that Lehigh fluted bullets appear to produce larger temporary stretch cavity than comparable lead bullets. The size of the TSC is still smaller than that produced by rifles by a pretty decent margin. My personal hunch is that this bullet design does create enough stretching to induce some tearing, and while that's not enough to make it a wonder bullet death blaster that turns a pistol into a rifle, it looks like it could be enough that it performs better than FMJ, possibly even better than decent hollow point ammo. At the very least, ED tends to penetrate to the ideal depth in most calibers, and it tends to perform the same after passing through a barrier. In some calibers, it can even defeat soft body armor. 
I do think these bullets deserve a lot more independent research. The test that I really want to see performed is a side-by-side -side comparison of wound tracks in animals that had been recently euthanized. But you would need several live pigs, a large freezer, and a bandsaw to do that testing in a controlled and humane manner. So leave a comment below telling James that he needs to fly me out to Texas or Louisiana for a pig hunt. Ultimately, I, I'm just not a first adopter kind of guy, so I probably won't be changing my carry load until I see a history of real world use from several decent sized law enforcement agencies. If you choose to carry it, I won't fault you because it's certainly good enough, although you may be pr paying a premium for unproven performance. Before anyone accuses me of having it out for Lehigh, I want to note that I've also tested their controlled chaos in several 223 and 300 blackout loads and their maximum expansion in 300 blackout subsonic. Aside from generally deeper penetration, they all functioned well. They expanded or fragmented as intended, penetrated adequately, and produced a significant tissue disruption. Even the subsonic 300 did pretty well for a subsonic round. Everything I've seen from Lehigh has at least done what they claim it does. So it isn't that I have it in for them, but I am still unconvinced that this fluted wounding mechanism is sufficiently proven to rely on for defense. What do you think? Is Lehigh better than Full Metal Jacket? Is it better than Jacket at Hollow Point? What is the best way to conclusively prove the effectiveness of it? Leave a comment below. Do you like watching gun-related content? Do you want to help stop YouTube from purging every bit of color from the platform in their efforts to create a bland, featureless, corporately acceptable gray paste? The best thing you can do to keep gun-related content thriving on YouTube is to do all those things YouTubers ask people to do at the end of videos. Please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this video to show Al Gore's rhythm section that you like seeing gun stuff. Now, I know you like every video we create, but if you watch a video from another gun channel that didn't have you on the edge of your seat the whole time, consider giving them a like too. We all benefit from seeing diverse content, and if you want to support us by voting with your hard-earned quatloos, then please support our sponsor, Top Gun Supply, the shooting sports superstore. But you don't owe us a damned thing, and we're grateful for the support you provide just by making it to the end of this video. Stay thirsty, my friends. Mm -hmm.